I have the privilege of introducing a dear friend, and I've got all this propaganda here. He's a um, internationally recognized lecturer, radio host, best-selling author, is columnist, uh, 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 well-known columnist whose articles have been referred to by writers in the LA Times Syndicate, MSNBC, Christianity Today, New, New Man Magazine, World Net Daily, Newsmax, and goes on and on and on of people that have used him as an authority. But let me tell you, um, he and Chris Putnam undertook a book called, uh, that dealt with the prophecy of the popes. And they published it that in, uh, I believe it was March or April of 2012. And they, among other things, predicted that the sitting pope at the time would abdicate. And a year later, in uh, February of 2013, the pope, for the first time in 600 years, abdicated, which of course put Tom Horn and Chris Putnam on the headlines, okay? And so, that, do you think that was, that'd be pretty good? No, no, they had a book coming out uh, last month or a few months ago now um, that I haven't talked to him about his ability to pick good titles. <laughs> the title of his second book was called Exo-Vaticana. And I've read the book and I respect it highly. I still don't understand why it was named that way. But the point I'm getting at is... Um, that book, as many of you may know, I have had a very early and continuing interest in an area that has to be the most difficult area to research on the landscape, the area called UFOs. It's very difficult to research because most of the information there is nonsense and foolishness, some, uh, some well-intended, some malicious. It's, it's a very, very difficult area to take seriously. And yet, I've discovered that they did a book, he and Chris Putnam, that is unquestionably the most scholarly, most thorough, most competent development of that very difficult area. And, uh, among, and, and among other things, it uh, predicts the, the, the it, re, it reveals that, of all things, the Vatican is openly, openly preparing to receive an alien visitor. Now, if that doesn't disturb you, it should. You weren't listening, okay? So, Tom, much to my delight, requested that I do the introduction to that, which gave me a preview glimpse of the chapters, and I was stunned with the depth of scholarship and the thoroughness that they've done, so I was pleased to be part of that. So, it's, it's become one of my most treasured volumes in my library, Exo Vaticana by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. Now, he's done a number of other books he's well known for, of course. Um, Apollyon Rising 2012. If you're interested in the, in, uh, the occult, uh, uh, the Freemasons, that sort of thing, there's lots of nonsense around. It's a great book on that, that and related subjects. What he doesn't have on the list here, he has published a book called Zenith 2016, which, which is Apollyon Rising brought up to date. So he modernized it, cleaned it up, added, added some things. And that's also become one of my favorite sources in an area that's very difficult to get competent insights into. Uh, the Freemasons being just an example of that. So uh, it's a, it, you're going to hear from one of the guys that I respect more. I can't think of anyone I respect more highly in the publishing field, in the Christian publishing field, uh, than Tom Horn. So... Uh, that's, a, that's as candidly and as strongly as I can express it. And where are Oh, there you are. Uh, that's, that's as good as it gets, Tom. <laughs> it's a privilege having you with us, my friend. Uh, God bless you. God bless you, mate. God bless you, my friend. Well, I was hiding back there hoping that he would keep on going on about all that stuff. <laughs> I was really enjoying that. I, I, can I get a copy of those notes? I might. Uh... I could probably never do it again. <laughs> uh, well, greetings, everybody. Uh, are you enjoying the Strategic Perspectives 2013? I almost said 2012. I'm still hung up in the past, ain't I? Old preachers can't ever get out of the past, can't ever stop preaching uh, the old sermons. I do want to say one thing. Uh, last night, um, Peter Flant gave you that piece of artwork. He said it was one of 14. 
And uh, I don't know how I felt about that. Uh, but if he's got 13 left over, I would think one maybe ought to make its way uh, towards Missouri. Don't you think so? Put the heat on him. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, maybe a, a fin could come your direction for your coffee. We'll just talk about that a little bit later. Oh, you're the crowd, and I'm supposed to be talking to you. Uh, I am glad to be here, and I was invited to come here today to talk to you, of all things, about the prophecy of the popes and how in the world did Chris Putnam and I predict a year in advance, not only that Pope Benedict would step down, but by the way, we got it actually to the month, and we didn't even know we did. We said in the book, if you read it, which came out before his resignation, we suggested that he was going to step down in April of 2012, citing health reasons and be the first pope to do so, as you say, in 600 years. When uh, April came and went, we thought, well, we missed the date, but the book's still important. But then when he did resign this year in February, the El Observatorio Romano, which is the official mouthpiece for the Vatican, gave an interview to the New York Times in which they said, well, really, he, reti he retired when he returned at the end of March 2012. He did it internally, made it official in April to the Curia, and we had actually got the month right. But there's another story if you read the book, because six 61 years ago, a Catholic mystic prophesied exactly when Gloria Olive, Pope Benedict, number 111 on the prophecy of the popes, would step down. 61 years in advance, he said it'll happen in April of 2012. So, uh, if you read the book, you'll go through a lot of that, and you'll find out that there are other mysteries that we only hint at that Putnam and I came across. For instance, having to do with the... Um, conclave itself, that process by which, that medieval process by which the cardinals go there to uh, St. Peter's Square, sequester themselves into the Sistine Chapel, and they go through that, that very ancient ritual of electing uh, a pope. And during this last election, there were a lot of questions, people out there asking questions, how does that process work? And you had comedian uh, Craig Ferguson, the talk show host guy, he was on TV, and he was saying, now, how does this process work? He says, I know they have these little papers, right, and they roll them up, and then they vote, and they tear them up, and then they throw them in that uh, thing that they've temporarily hooked up, that stove with the temporary stove pipe that's going up out of the top of the Sistine Chapel, and they mix chemicals with it. And he said, now, if the smoke comes up and it's black, they haven't yet elected a pope. If the smoke comes out and it's white, they have elected a pope. But Ferguson said, what would we make of it if all of a sudden green smoke started coming up out of the Sistine Chapel? And Putnam and I put our heads together on that, rolled up little pieces of paper, green smoke. We determined that if that happened, that Willie Nelson had snuck into the Sistine Chapel and they need to get him out of there, right? Well, okay, that's not what I'm here to talk about, but we did come across other mysteries, I'm just saying, and maybe at some point we'll talk about some of that nonsense uh, too. Okay, to get started, I want to blame you folks for the excursion that I've been on for the last 24 months, or at least those of you who were here two years ago when I spoke on transhumanism. How many were here two years ago, so some of you were, well, I blame you for what I've had to go through for the last 24 months. Want to know why? Because any time you get in an auditorium filled with spirit-filled people, you're going to start getting inspired, right? That's the problem. Here I was, minding my own business, standing back there with my son. You can see him standing there, Joe Artis, the wild man of the Ozarks. And uh, we were talking about how it was unusual that you have a 900-year-old medieval prophecy that's about to come to its end, and nobody had written a thorough investigation into the prophecy of the popes. Do you believe in it? you not believe in it? What does it mean? Who does believe in it that's in the Vatican? Uh, why did some popes go out of their way to show themselves as being the fulfillment of it? And all of that. So we're back there minding our own business, but the radiation coming off of you folks is inspiring me 
And did that ever get me in trouble? So all of a sudden, I didn't have any more sense than to think, well, okay then, if nobody's written it, I'm a publisher. Maybe I have an insight on writing this book and doing the investigation. So I go up here in my beautiful room to write down some notes on the, how I would go about investigating the prophecy of the popes. But because I'm on the road, my cell phone's turned off, I'm thinking, now if somebody's trying to get an emergency contact through to me, they might have sent me an email. So I opened up my email, believe it or not, and here is an email from a guy by the name of Chris Putnam. Now, at that time, I didn't know Chris. We'd never spoke. I didn't know anything about him. I, somebody, I think, had told me that he had a blog site, but that was all I knew. Uh, and, uh, but uh, here's this email from Chris Putnam, and I opened the email, and can you believe he wants to talk to me about the prophecy of the popes? <laughs> and uh, to make a long story short, I can't give it to you blow by blow, but... That set in motion what we believe to be a whole series of preternatural events leading up to the actual and accurate prediction. And I am not a prophet. This was all based on systematized approach, which you can read about if you have or, or will read that book. Oh, this film just came out. Joseph Farah produced this movie you see there on the screen, The Last Pope. This was produced by the same film company that made the Isaiah 910 Judgment, which has been the number one selling uh, Christian faith film for a year and a half based on the Harbinger stuff that uh, our friend Jonathan Kahn did. And, uh, but so that just came out, and it's based upon this story. What happened? How did we get involved with it? They go all over the world. Jerome Corsi goes over to uh, the Vatican, talks with Vatican historians. Then they go to Ireland. They talk with the, the leaders of the church, the historians over there about Malachi Morgair. And as I'm going along here and I say that name Malachi Morgair, it dawns on me that a whole lot of you may not even know what I'm talking about with the prophecy of the Pope. So, very quickly... In 1139, there was a Catholic bishop. He was a very popular bishop. I got to stay right here. Boy, do I have a bad habit of walking away from the pulpit. And they got on me about it last time, and they warned me again. They said, there'll be a couple of blondes down there. They're incognito. You all know which ones they are. But if you walk away from the pulpit, they will mace you back into the position. <laughs> It's hard to speak when you're living under such terrorism. Don't we have laws against this kind of stuff? For crying out loud. But so now it's in my head, right? I'm trying to think about what I want to talk about, but I start to go this way, and I can hear in the back of my mind, recalculating. <laughs> turn left at the crack. Do a U-turn, recalculating. Uh, 1139, a priest by the name of Malachi Morgair, an Irish bishop, very popular. He uh, served in an area that was called Armagh, which is now known as Northern Ireland. This was a priest who was accredited with having the gift of healing and also having the gift of prophecy. But in 1139, he is summoned to Rome by the then pope, Pope Innocent II. And like every priest in his day, of course, you know, he wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to see the Vatican City. He dreamed of meeting the Pope. And so he gets together his entourage and their beasts of burden and their carts and all of that. And they begin this nine-month arduous journey across Europe. And uh, as they're going, they see the conditions of the world. Uh, the pain, the suffering, the plagues of the 11th century that are devastating so many uh, townships and people, the wantonness, the hunger. And all of this is weighing really heavy on uh, Malachi's mind. He was already a priest of the people anyway, if you know what I mean. And then nine months later, now it's 1140, and he arrives in the Vatican City. And he is put off immediately by what he finds there. This is a time, by the way, in history that is known as the pornocracy. It was a time where the Pope and those around him and the Vatican, they embellished all of this privilege and finery and wine and pomp and circumstance and food and all of the splendor. And Malachi comes riding in with his donkey pulling some cart and he has just seen what's going on across the then known world and he is really offset by what he finds there. So he conducts his business with Benedict II, or with uh, Bene Pope Benedict. Uh, time traveling here again, sorry. 
He conducts his business with Innocent the second and uh, gives an update on his diocese and then he can't wait to get out of the city and this is where things get interesting. Because according to history and tradition, as Malachi is coming up out of the Seven Hill City, all of a sudden something happens to him. First of all, he utters one line in Latin that is essentially a judgment upon the papacy. Uh, and the flavor of this judgment is that uh, God is only going to allow this to go so long. That then is followed by a series of 112 lines that he writes down in Latin. Each one of these symbolic of each pope that would arrive in succession with the pope following Innocent II, which is Celestine II, all the way down to the final pope. And that is the pope, he says, line number 112. That is the pope that will reside in Rome when the church and the world enter into the great tribulation period, ending with the destruction of Rome and the return of what he calls the great and terrible judge, that is Jesus Christ, who's going to judge his people, including this religious system that he had found at that moment to be so offensive. Now, that's what uh, Chris Putnam and I started investigating, but it led to places that we would have never thought uh, we were going to go. Uh, bottom line this, it remained in the uh, Vatican archives, the prophecy did, for about 400 years. We don't even know how it got into the Vatican archives, but somehow it did. Uh, and it was hidden there like so many other things have been hidden inside those secret archives. You know, the, the Vatican, they basically wrote the rules for central intelligence and the FBI. Much of what they developed in terms of concealing documentation is what we adopted into our intelligence agencies later on. But in 1595, a Benedictine historian by the name of Arnold de Wyan, publishes the prophecy of the popes. He takes it out of the archives, puts it in his 1,700-page book, Lignum Vita, and it comes out, and it's now in the public forum. And here is the mystery. From that day and forward, the prophecy of the popes actually has seemed to increase in terms of its accuracy. If it had been a fraud concocted, concocted in 1590s and they made the first part of it look like it was really real, right? Then you would expect it from that time forward. Now that we can watch it, it would fall apart, but it hasn't. It's actually become more accurate and this has implied something. It has implied that it is time to take a drink of this water. <laughs> in addition to that... <laughs> It has implied to some people that the prophecy of the popes was either, uh, one, divinely inspired, or number two, demonically inspired, and it is some part of a great deception, or number three, and this is the one that I tend to kind of lean toward 60-40, uh, is that for whatever reason, this document has held a place of importance in the mind of the cardinal electors. And they have only been electing popes that could be seen in one way or another as fulfilling their line in the prophecy. And therefore, it has become a self-fulfilling prophecy whether or not it was ever originally uh, given by God or the devil. For instance, take just the last three popes as an example. Pope number 110 his line in the prophecy was de laboris solis, or from the Latin to the English, he will come through the labor of the sun. And this was the line for Pope John Paul II, who was born during a partial solar eclipse, and then years later actually died and was buried through a very rare hybrid eclipse. And so he literally entered the world and exited the world through the labor of the sun. Then came line number 111, Gloria Olive. This was the line for Benedict, and this was the one that says, He will be the glory of the olives. And this was interesting because in the lead up to the election of Benedict, there were a lot of the watchers of the prophecy, right? They were saying, this guy is going to be a Benedictine priest because their symbol is the olive branch and their priests are known as the Olivetans. Therefore, the glory of the olives, he's going to be a Benedictine priest. Well, then the conclave came and they elected a German 
uh, uh, cardinal by the name of Rebsinger, who was not a Benedictine, and everybody was thinking, uh-oh, something just suddenly really fell apart in the prophecy of the popes. Then, a few hours later, Benedict walks out there into the well where the Pope stands uh, in St. Peter's Square, and he announces two things. Number one, that he had been born on the feast day of St. Benedict, the founder of the Benedictine order, and secondly, that he was taking, therefore, as his name, Benedict the Sixteenth, in an astonishing fulfillment of this line number 111 of the prophecy of the Popes. But it also, of course, indicates he may have selected that name because what? Some kind of backroom deal you have to make yourself to appear to be a fulfillment of the prophecy? Uh, I don't know, but it does bring us then to the final line, line number 112, which is the line for Pope Francis I, and the question, does George Bergoglio uh, fulfill the final line in the prophecy? And here is what the prophecy says. This is the most expressive line in the prophecy of the popes, and it says this, in the extreme persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will pastor his sheep in many tribulations, and when those things are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people the end. That is the final line in the prophecy, a 900-year-old prophecy, and it is the line for Pope Francis. Now the question then is, does Bergoglio fulfill this line? First of all, part of it we're going to have to wait and see. Because if he is the Pope residing at the Vatican, as the great tribulation unfolds around us, we're all going to know that in a very short period of time, I suspect. But the second thing was this line, Peter the Roman. Because of that line, some of the people who were watching the prophecy, not the scholars who always had a different view on this, but many of the people in the public, they thought, okay, it's got to be a guy, right, who's going to have some part of his name is Peter. And if he's an Italian or in the old language a Roman, we're going to literally have a guy named Peter the Roman who becomes uh, the next pope. And so people were watching that. They thought the current Secretary of State, uh, Tarsicio Pietro, Peter uh, Bertone, who was an Italian, they thought, wow, if he becomes the pope, I mean, run for the hills, right? Start crying for the rocks to fall on us because the man is here. And uh, people were excited about it. Now, Chris Putnam and I are on TV shows a year in advance that you can watch on YouTube in which we said it would be a mistake to lock yourself into that opinion for a couple of reasons. Number one, let me go back to this previous slide. It comes from understanding how the prophecy of the popes work in that the prophecy never did pick a person's Christian name or a name that they were born with. In other words, John Paul II was not born De Labora Solis. Uh, Benedict was not born Gloria Olive. The lines in the prophecy always tell us something about the character of the Pope, how he wants to model uh, his pastorship or his papacy in Rome. And for that reason, many uh, Catholic scholars especially had always said the final Pope will not have the name Peter. The title Peter the Roman is symbolic. And in fact, what several of them believed was he's called Peter because he is the consummation of the Petrine office, the office of Peter as it is known in Rome. See, if you understand Catholic belief, they, and some of you I'm sure are Catholic or were raised Catholic, but they believe that their very first pope was uh, the Apostle Peter from the New Testament, and it is upon his throne that every pope in succession uh, provides an unbroken line of leadership for Roman Catholicism, and therefore every pope is known. In fact, George Bergoglio is a Jesuit, and the Jesuits always refer to every pope as the latest Peter in in the line. So many Catholic scholars believe that this is simply talking about the consummation of the office, the final line, the final Peter, if you will. But then the term the Roman becomes really interested, is interesting. Is it because he is of Italian descent? Both his mother and father are full-blooded Italians, so in that sense you could refer to them as Roman. But Catholic scholars wrote as many as decades ago that what it actually implies is that this will be a guy who will refascinate the world with the office of the papacy, who will refascinate the world with Roman Catholicism. And folks, if this guy has done anything, it has fascinated the world with the office of the Pope. Have, however, 
Having said that, it's spooky how Bergoglio has gone out of his way to attach himself to the literal title, Peter the Roman, and to wrap himself in the final line of that language. First of all, because he took as his namesake Francisco, or Francis as he's more commonly called today, of Assisi. That is his namesake. But Francis was born Giovanni and later changed his name to Francesco di Pietro, Peter de Bernardone. And as an Italian, his name literally translates Peter the Roman. When he chose him as his namesake, you could have knocked me and Chris Putnam over with a feather that he went out of his way to do that. But it gets even more intriguing. Know this. Pope Francis is selling himself as a humble man, and he may be a humble man, but that does not mean he is an ignorant man. He is a Jesuit. He has advanced degrees in science, in history. He is very familiar that he is the final line in the prophecy of the popes. He knows that. He also knows, however, that Francis of Assisi was a mystic like Malachi Morgair. In fact, Francis of Assisi only lived 50 years after the prophecy of the popes was given. There's some evidence he was familiar with it, but even if he wasn't, Francis of Assisi prophesied too about the final pope. And do you want to know what he said about the final pope? Here's an excerpt from his prophecy. He says he will be raised to the pontificate who by his cunning will endeavor to draw many into error and death. For in those days, Jesus Christ will send them not a true pastor, but a destroyer. Why in the world would Bergoglio name himself after a guy whose name means Peter the Roman and whose prophecy implies the very last line, 112, that this guy will be a deceiver who is going to lead the world into destruction, but it keeps getting even better. Three weeks ago, Bergoglio wrapped himself in it again. He names a guy that we actually thought might be the final pope, a cardinal who is an Italian, a Roman, by the name of Pietro Perellin, a guy whose name means Peter the Roman, was just named as the new Secretary of State for the Vatican. And this is interesting because uh, for those of you who might be watching this via live stream who are Catholics, those who are here who are Catholics and know uh, history, and I know there are some here that know it a lot better than I do, John Loeffler is in the building, right? Um, and, uh, and also, um, those who have paid attention to this history, you are familiar that in the background of Catholicism, some of the ancient prophecies, more than one, foresaw the end times. And what did they see? They saw that something is going to happen to the rightful pope. That he is what? One says maybe he's going to die or be killed. Another says maybe he's going to be arrested. Uh, But something happens that moves the Pope out of office. And then an anti-Pope rises up under him. And that guy is the one that's really the bad one. Well, by doing what he just did with Pietro Perellin, George Bergoglio just put into place something that if something should happen to him and his Carmelingo, the Secretary of State would step up into the office of the Pope, a man whose name literally means Peter the Roman. Now, I can't tell you that that's going to happen. I don't hope something happens to uh, uh, Pope Francis other than maybe getting saved. (laughs) But there's some very weird stuff going on. Okay, I got to go very, what time, what is it here? I have 30 minutes left. As a Jesuit, Francis may be linked to something even more intriguing and that could connect him to end times prophecy as depicted in Chuck Missler's masterpiece, Alien Encounters, and the far humbler and recent Exo Vaticana, which basically stole Chuck's ideas and reframed them in our own language. But that is the subject, astrobiology. I say this because since publishing Petrus Romanus and Exo Vaticana, we learned that the new pope has a relationship with the members of the VORG, the Vatican Observatory Research Group. First of all, as a young adult, he earned a master's degree in chemistry from the University of Buenos Aires and had scientific ambitions prior to entering the Jesuit order, including studies in astrobiology, life on other planets. Secondly, when the current leader of the Borg, Jose Gabriel Funes, 
also from Argentina, entered the Jesuit order. One of his three examiners was Bergoglio. So now we have a relationship between uh, George Bergoglio, Pope Francis, and the astronomers who you're going to find out some of the spooky stuff they're talking about here in a little bit. And thirdly, in a recent interview with the Catholic press, Funes says that this first Jesuit pope is soon going to turn his attention to issues like astrobiology exactly as we predicted in the final chapter of Exo Vaticana. And folks, that is where stuff now finally starts getting very, very interesting because of a couple of things that another famous Jesuit by the name of Malachi Martin had to say before he died. How many of you are familiar with Malachi Martin? Most of you are not. Very quickly, this guy was no Johnny-come-lately. Uh, he was an insider of insiders at the Vatican. He was a Jesuit. He worked for three popes. He was a formidable polyglot. He could speak 17 languages, translated numerous ancient and extinct languages. In fact, he worked for the Vatican in the Holy See uh, 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 transcribing the Dead Sea Scrolls, part of which was being talked about last night, uh, his work on those documents for the Vatican. Uh, he was a personal friend of Augustine B., who is one of the most famous Jesuits Jesuits in history. He had access to the deepest secrets, including the uh, final mysteries of Fatima, which he certainly implied were not released in 2000 when the Vatican said that they were. But in any case, he was a personal friend of the Pope's. At one point, he asked the Pope if he could have leave of his priestly duties. He moved to New York City, where he became a multi-time best-selling New York Times writer of fiction and nonfiction, or his fiction he called faction, fiction based on fact. And if, what if, if part of his fiction is based on fact, we only have, well, let's just say there was some very, very scary, naughty stuff going on in the Vatican. And long before the news hit the fan about pedophilism, Malachi was out there saying that it was happening and he was being mocked by many of the other priests. But much of what he said came out later on down the line to indeed be a fact. But two of the things that he said that I want to focus on. Number one, he wrote this book right here, The Jesuits, The Society of Jesus and the Betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church. If you haven't read it, get it and read it because you will see that exactly what he predicted was happening but that he hoped would not happen indeed is and has happened. And what he says in this book is that there was a secret war that was going on between the Jesuits and the other priesthood for the control of the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican in particular. Um, the Vatican, folks, is not like any other Christian denomination. There are 90 ambassadors at any time parked uh, there at the Vatican City. It has relationships, political and otherwise, with most of the major nations around the world. And according to Malachi, the Jesuits wanted to seize control of the Vatican. For what purpose? He said they, wanted to, he, they want to use it as a machine that will give assistance to the rise of the new world order. And furthermore, he said, uh, they want to use it. They want, basically, they want, to, they want to work in tandem with the coming of the Antichrist for the implementation of the objectives of the Antichrist. And a brother Malachi must be rolling over in his grave today. Or excuse me, he must be rolling over in purgatory Because the first ever Jesuit was just elected as the Pope. And this war he was so concerned about evidently has just been won. But there's a more intriguing thing that he had to talk about. And that was what he said was going on with those Jesuits on the top of a mountain in southeastern Arizona. How many of you were aware that an hour away from Tucson, Arizona... There is an advanced telescope and an observatory group that literally forced their way onto the top of that mountain in Arizona, and part of it is owned by the Vatican. And when Art Bell in 1997 was interviewing Malachi Martin on the late night talk show Coast to Coast AM, he asked him, he said, uh, he said Father, 
Why did the Vatican force themselves onto a top of a mountain in Arizona? And why is the Vatican so heavily invested in the study of deep space? And at the time, Malachi Martin's answer ignited a firestorm. Chuck, I know you'll remember what he said. He said, they're there on the top of that mountain observing the space. He said, because at the highest levels of Vatican governance and geopolitics, he said, they know what is approaching the earth and that it will be of the utmost importance in coming years. Now, he put about a decade time frame on that, and almost to the date a decade later in 2009, the Vatican abruptly called for an astrobiology study week. They had the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, the scientists for the Vatican, bring together 30 of the most powerful astronomers in the world, geologists, uh, theoretical physicists, but they also brought in theologians. And that whole week, guess what they discussed? They discussed what will the impact be on faith, on religion, given the disclosure or the discovery of advanced extraterrestrial intelligence in the universe. 90 days later, the Royal Society, the oldest scientific body in the world, convened a meeting in the UK, January 2010, in which they invited experts from all over the world. And by the way, I even have their little thing right here in front of me for the discussion this is what they brought them together for. And, and imagine this. This scientific body is 350 years old. They've never done this before. But 90 days after the Vatican, they came together to discuss, quote, the detection of extraterrestrial life and the consequences for science and society. And at the time, uh, Lord Martin Rees, who was the head of the Royal Society, and also the astronomer Roy Al, the astronomer to the Queen. Uh, he said, sorry, I went a little, I almost said gay on you there for a minute, but <laughs> Homeland Security is on the way to the door, shut us down, hate speech. Uh, now what that did to my brain, I may never recover from. <laughs> to discuss the detection of alien intelligence. Well, of course, following those two back-to-back -back meetings, media around the world were in a frenzy. They wanted to talk to some of those people. Why is the Vatican asking what the impact is going to be on faith and religion given the detection of extraterrestrial intelligence? And why are all of the, the members of the oldest science body in the world coming together to talk about the detection? And so the Vatican sent out Gabriel Jose Funes, the head of the Vatican Observatory Research Group, who immediately started lobbing these little softballs out there to the media. Oh, well, it's just in case, you know. The Vatican's made some mistakes in the past. We don't think we want any more, you know, uh, issues with uh, trampling on scientific uh, thought and blah, 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 blah. But then he starts saying some important things. As in he says, however, the extraterrestrial is our brother. And furthermore, he said, it is not only not incompatible with Christianity to believe in extraterrestrial intelligence, but he said, if you do not believe in extraterrestrial intelligence, that is the heresy because, he said, it puts limits on God's creative ability. And that began what has been a slow process over the last three years of what is kind of a, a developing scheme, if you will, and theological uh, arguments at the Vatican. But keep this in mind, some of these are opus dei level theologians who write theology for the Pope's university in Rome. And when you see some of the stuff they're writing right now, it'll put cold chills down your spine. But then he said something I had to just take, I thought, now how could he possibly know this, Chuck? He says that extraterrestrial intelligence discovery will not challenge the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. How could you know that? Right? Unless you've made some kind of Mephistophelian bargain, some Faustian deal with some power that you happen to think is an extraterrestrial intelligence, how could you already know it's not going to challenge the authority of the Roman Catholic Church? That is a very mysterious statement, but maybe he knew a little something about what another priest was saying.
And this guy was no Johnny come lately either, Monsignor Coroldo Balduce. He was the official spokesperson for the Vatican on the subject of UFOs and aliens. And he died about three years ago under mysterious circumstances, just before he died. He was out there on Italian television. He partook in a, a, a documentary that was made here in the U.S. And guess what he was saying? He was saying the aliens exist and they are here now. As an exorcist for the church, he said they're not angels and they're not demons. These are advanced people, if you will, and they are morally superior to us. This is an argument that they continue to make, and they're becoming more and more adamant about it, that what we know about ourselves is that we are fallen, right? But we could not necessarily assume the same thing about our space brethren, and if they're unfallen, they're closer to God than we are. Therefore, they have a better understanding of the gospel and of the Godhead and of the nature of God. And when they started out through Three years ago, uh, 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 Funes was saying, I'd like to baptize an alien into the Catholic faith. Well, that's not what they're saying today. What they're saying is they are coming here and they're going to baptize us into their faith and it is going to require us to make changes to our knowledge, to our understanding of the gospel. In fact, some of their deepest theologians have said perhaps everything we think we know about the gospel is going to have to be thrown out. But guess what else Balduce said? He said, not only is the Vatican aware of the alien presence that's already on earth now, and this just before he died, he said they are using their embassies from around the world to gather information on the alien presence and their agenda. Might have been an oops moment because he didn't live much longer after that. But the Vatican has never came out and retracted those statements. They've never taken objection to them. They have simply left uh, them out there. Got to go very quickly. In more recent years, the, I took another drink of water. In more recent years, the Jesuits associated with Mount Graham have become even more outspoken on the alien reality and agenda as I was just talking about. Now, how Chris Putnam and I became aware of this. So we're out there and we're doing shows on Petrus Romanus. And uh, inevitably, when we were on these um, talk shows, the radio call-in talk shows, people would be calling in and they'd be asking us, oh yeah, okay, but what do you make of the Vatican ET connection. And because we wanted to be able to provide a qualified answer and not just come across, you know, as a couple of evangelicals out there taking these Catholic guys, taking their words out of context, we wanted to go to the horse's mouth. Or I, we wanted to go to the Catholic horse's mouth. You know there's Catholic horses, don't you? There is. New York, other places, they have them great big churches, and every year they, they bring in all the animals. How many of you know what I'm saying is true? And they sanctify them, and they dedicate them to the Catholic faith. Now, uh, just to be sure, so that we don't get a conspiracy started after this, some of you know that my wife has 28 horses. Uh, but we have had every one of them certified evangelical. Not caught one of them praying with a rosary. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. We wanted to go to the horse's mouth, and we knew, brother, that the, I mean, this was like a dream, right? The best way to do this would be if somehow, some way, we could get up to the top of Mount Graham in Arizona and talk to the astronomers there. Now, that was a big maybe, Right? Uh, you can't just, you don't just drive up to the top of Mount Graham and jump out and say, I'm here to see the aliens. <laughs> it's fenced off way down off the mountain, uh, uh, signs in all kinds of languages talking about the horrific things that will happen to you if you climb over the fence and try to go up there. So uh, I found out that if I was going to have any chance, I had to negotiate this through the Arizona State University. That's a story all by itself, but I was successful in doing that. Uh, and if you read the book Exo Vaticana, the young people have told me, man, they just love that first chapter. They say it's like an Indiana Jones scene, right? How we went up that mountain. But I don't have time to tell you that story. Just in the back of your mind as I'm talking, just be humming. Dun -dun 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 -dun. <laughs> but that's where we went, to the top of the mountain. 
And uh, when we got up there, now I have to say, I was very impressed with the Jesuit who was on duty that day. He's not the one we had been hoping to talk to, but he was a Jesuit astronomer. We later did talk to the one we wanted to talk to, but he was an astronomer and uh, very cordial. I mean, this guy could give evangelicals lessons on how to behave in a Christ-like manner. Very warm, very cordial, answered all of our questions, took us and showed us the very humble areas where the uh, astronomers sleep when they're there and the places where they eat. But then finally, of course, we went up the ladder, I mean, we went up the stairway and we wind up there with the Vatican's Astronomical or Advanced Technology Telescope. And they allowed us to do all kinds of crazy stuff. We clumb all over the telescope, went up above it, went down below it. Down below, there's an area chained off. Uh, they unchained it so we could stand on that platform. And then once I got up there, I saw all these electrical warnings around me with crossbones. And I thought, I now I know why you let us stand on the platform. <laughs> We're not falling for it. So we got off the platform. But we went, but that guy confirmed for us everything that we had been asking, and we were really straightforward. By the way, uh, the wild man was our cameraman that day, and we have that Jesuit on film talking about some of this astonishing belief system, and we may make a documentary called Exo Vatican of the Movie because we got even more astonishing film when we came down off of that mountain, and uh, maybe that'll happen and maybe it won't. But anyway, we talked to him, but he did confirm that. He, like some of the other astronomers up there, we were surprised when he just started saying, uh, talking about the number of UFOs that they constantly see above that mountain and in deep space using those telescopes. We hadn't even asked the question. He just started talking about it. We found that to be extraordinary. Uh, but he also said this, which was key to us. He said, these days the Vatican only uses their advanced telescope for one reason, and that is to monitor exo-worlds where they believe that there may be uh, the conditions for life, including the possibility of advanced intelligence. So we found that to be very confirming. Anyway, let me make the story the shory. I'm going to make the shory faster. Uh, we left there. We walked up the hill about a city block to the radio telescope. There's three telescopes on the top of Mount Graham. So we went to the radio telescope. Nobody was on duty that day, but uh, our guide had keys, took us in, uh, opened all the doors, turned on all the lights. We got to see that gigantic telescope. We went into the control room. We saw the screens were sitting there lit up with images of deep space. But because we couldn't talk to any technicians or astronomers, we left there. We went out. We walked two more city blocks up to the top of the mountain. And that's where sits the large binocular telescope. It is the largest telescope in the world. It makes images of deep space that are better than the Hubble telescope. It's got these giant twin uh, mirrors, and that place was packed. People in the lunchroom, people walking all over the place, a whole bunch of astronomers from Germany making adjustments to the large uh, telescope. I don't even know how many stories high this thing is. You have, we kept riding elevators to different floors, different floors. We're just going up, 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 up. And each stage of the way, the systems engineer, who they gave us, and by the way, he spent the entire day with us. We were his only mission the whole day. We were just surprised by that. Uh, and uh, very educated guy, lead uh, engineer for the Large Binocular Telescope. But if you watch the, the, the book trailer for Exo Vaticana, You'll see a scene in there where we are way up on this platform, way up over the top of the large binocular telescope looking down. And you'll see the systems engineer take uh, a laser pointer and he points down between the two twin mirrors, he points down to this red device, this big red device in the middle, and he says, this is the Lucifer device. And yes, that is exactly what it really is called. It's an acronym, L-U-C-I-F-E-R. It is a piece of infrared technology that they, the Catholics, whoever else want to be able to use that device, that they use that infrared, can see deeper into space. It can see fainter objects. It can see into areas of the light spectrum that other telescopes and your natural eyesight cannot see into. In fact, if you go to YouTube and type in infrared UFO, 
you'll see some of the most astonishing deep space UFOs ever captured on film that were picked up with infrared when other telescopes looking at the same part of space at the same time didn't see anything whatsoever. They're invisible to the human eye, but they can see them with the Lucifer device. Okay, now, so we, we did all that, and now we're going to come down off the mountain. And brother, do we got so many notes. We're thinking, where is Chuck Missler when you need him? <laughs> We got we to gotta put all this stuff together, right? Uh, but we didn't know we had only started the learning process. We come down off the mountain. We knew that the indigenous people, especially the Apache Indians, but all of the Indian tribes in Arizona, had been opposed to the Vatican going up onto the top of that mount to build a telescope. In fact, they had joined environmentalists or got environmentalists to join them, and they filed a lawsuit to try to stop them from going up there. But the, somebody from the Vatican must have been really deep in the back pocket of the governor because they did an end run around uh, uh, environmental law and basically by fiat declared they were going to allow the Vatican to join NASA to go up there. And by the way, at the time, dear sister, <laughs> look at that. Said little portable Catholic blessing cloths. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I guess you're probably getting tired of that, huh? Look at this guy with the face thing, man. Really? Yeah, but you're not standing up here under all these hot lights. Don't give me some kind of problem about the way I look. Now, see, I won't be able to say anything bad about the Catholics because I just got the Catholic cloth. <laughs> put it on. Just put it up there and leave it up there. <laughs> I can play dominoes better than you. Um, well, hey, what we found out was astonishing. Uh, and, Chuck, I don't know if you even knew this, but uh, we found, because what we thought was, okay, the Indians are fighting the cowboys there, the Catholic cowboys. They don't want them to go up onto the top of that mountain, probably because it's sacred ground, right? Like their, their elders lived and died there for hundreds of years and hunted on the mountain, and probably some of their bones are on the mountain, and it's sacred ground. And No, that's not the, that was not the deal. Now, that might be true, but that's not why they did not want them up there. The Apache Indian did not want the Catholic Church going up there because Mount Graham is one of four of the most holiest mountains in the world to all American Indians, and it is because that mountain for them is what we would call in modern lingo a stargate. It is a portal. They believe that the top of that mountain represents a gateway through which other dimensional entities enter into and exit from this world. Now we were wondering in real conspiratorial tones why the Vatican. Of all mountains, why did they fight to get to the top of that mountain? Once we came into that history, everything started kind of slowly changing in our suspicions about why they wanted to go up there. Oh, and let me add one more thing. For those who may think that that is just an Apache Indian idea, this idea that there could be um, specific locations on earth that are areas, let's say, that are specifically gateways. They are geographic locations where doorways can open and close. Now, I'm not dogmatic about this, but I will tell you there is a lot of reasons, in my opinion, and I'm not the theologian Missler is, and you've got to know if I'm wrong later, he's just going to slap me upside the head and say, boy, don't ever do that again. There are a lot of reasons in the Bible to believe there could be something to this. Note that Moses had to go to the top of Mount Sinai there to meet with God. Note that when Jesus returns, his feet touches the top of the Mount of Olives and he descends down uh, from that point. Note in the apocryphal book of Enoch, which is still in some versions of the Bible, 
that in the days of Jared, Noah's great grandfather, 200 powerful angels known as the Watchers came down onto Mount Hermon and from the top of Hermon walked down into the valley of the plain. And that la the language around that mountain means the forbidden place. And years later, Jesus is talking to his disciples and, uh, in, in Caesarea Philippi and I think he turns and he looks towards Mount Hermon because he's right in that area. And that is where the Greeks at that time had, had built this dedicatory, if you will, to the horned demon Pan. And Jesus, that's right where he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Now leap forward, Genesis 28, Jacob's ladder. And what happens with Jacob in his uh, night vision of his ladder? He wakes up the next morning. He has seen angels ascending and descending from a very specific location, and it scares the thunder out of him. He gets the oil out and starts anointing the whole place. But what does Genesis 28 says that he says? He says, there is a gate here to the house of God. An opening where he saw angels ascending and descending. You could get an even more interesting feasibility from Genesis chapter 10. Cush begat Nimrod. And Nimrod began to be a mighty. And this is the Hebrew word giborim, who many people believe are the offspring of the watchers and the Nephilim. It literally can read in the Hebrew, uh, uh, Nimrod began to be a giborim or a mighty man. Now, Again, I'm not dogmatic, but if that implies something began happening to him, his genetics began changing, or somehow he begins becoming an offspring of the watchers and angels, well, then maybe his eyes were open because in the very next chapter, what does he do? It says that he goes to build a tower whose top will reach into Shamayim, the dwelling place of God. And many ancient uh, uh, Jewish writers of that uh, legend say that he literally could see into the throne room of God and went there to build a tower to lead the armies of the earth up to challenge God. And God came down and saw what they were going to do and said, it will not be restrained from them what they have imagined to do. And what did they imagine to do? To build a tower whose top would reach into Shemayim. Okay, now I might be making a lot out of nothing and it could be that none of that implies that there are specific locations on the earth that are entry and exit ways, but that is definitely what the Apache Indian believe about Mount Graham. And furthermore, <laughs> when you look into their creation mythos, you know what they saw? They speak, this is the ancient creation theory from the Apache Indians. They say, in the time before time, a large silvery disc descended down over the mountain. And in the disc was a bearded man. He was the creator. And they say he began to create everything that is upon the earth. Soon after, they say, another man came through the portal, but they say he wasn't really a man. They say he was a dragon, and he began to deceive the populations of the world. Then they say, other weird uh, owl-like men started coming through the portal. And when you look at their drawing, drawings, it looks like the alien greys are coming through something. Then they say giants, Nephilim, start coming through the portal. And they start spreading out across the ancient Arizona badlands. And they're killing the Indians and they're raping and pillaging. And the Indians run into the tunnel or the caves and they start crying to God, whoever God is, save us. And uh, in their legend, it says that the sun god destroyed uh, the giants and saved them. And that's why down there around Phoenix, it's called the Valley of the Sun. Now, of course, the sun also shines there because I grew up there and it'll cook your kitten in a little while, right? But it really goes back to that end in folklore. So do the superstitious mountains. Superstitious mountains are named the way they are because of what they saw what am I doing? The microphone. It always does. I have the strangest ears. They probably were wonderful when I was born. And then I got ran over by a car. I did. And it tore them off. And they sewed them back on. Stupid sewers. And ever since then, nobody can keep a headset on me. Really, and pretty soon I'm using this pulling off and I'm holding it like this as I'm walking around talking. 
uh, a Spock, I'm not. I don't have the right ears for doing this kind of business. Well, in any case, that is what they uh, believe about Mount Graham, and that's why they didn't want them going up there. Uh, I'm almost out of time, so let me do this real quickly. After our visit to VAD, another thing that was really important was I got a hold of Brother Guy Consolmagno. Now, Consolmagno is a very important astronomer for the church, one of their leading astronomers. Um, he splits his time between Mount Graham in Arizona and uh, the Pope's summer residence in Gondolfo, Italy, where they also have a telescope there that the Pope can use. Uh, he's the keeper of the Vatican's collection of meteorites and other things that have fallen down from the earth. You always, often see pictures of Brother Guy Consmanago uh, with the Pope. But I wanted to talk to him because of this book right here, Intelligent Life in the Universe. Uh, the subtitle, Catholic Belief and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life by Brother Guy Consmanago, a Consmanago. I wanted to read this book because when it was first published a few years ago, it was instantly pulled from the market by the Catholic Church. They published it with their Catholic-owned uh, 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 Catholic Truth Society publishing house. I made an order. I never got my order. I kept making orders. I couldn't get any orders. Before I know it, they've put it out of print. And it even appeared that they had went about and made a concerted effort to get every copy that had been sold and to pull it from the market. I wanted to know why that was the case. So when I came down off the mountain, I contacted Brother Guy Consman. I'll go through the observatory website. Told him that we had just been to Mount Graham. We had missed him there and had hoped to talk to him there. Wanted to know if he'd be willing to allow us to interview him, which he did four times from Rome via the internet. But in that very first email, and it was a good thing, time for the Catholic cloth, it was a good thing that I asked him in the first interchange, because I don't think I'd have got it later on. I asked him, is there any way I can get a copy of Intelligent Life in the Universe, which you wrote, either just a used copy or the PDF, and he sent me the PDF. And guess what? We make the PDF of the book available free on that DVD they got back there uh, on that table. And if you get that DVD, by the way, it's got tens of thousands of pages of information. It's got 20-some hours of interviews. When the Royal Society was meeting over there, I decided that our Royal Society would meet over here. And we did 20 hours of interviews. We interviewed Chuck Missler. We interviewed uh, the former leader of the Military of Defense for the Government of Britain, uh, Nick Pope. Uh, we got one of the last interviews with Jesse Marcel Jr. before he died a few weeks ago about what actually happened there in Roswell. 20 hours. It's all on their free MP3 format. You can put it in your little device, listen to it as you drive. But this book is in there. And what does this book say? Well, when I asked Brother Consul Magno about what these churchmen were saying, that the aliens are coming and it's going to require us to have to change our understanding of the gospel he quoted from his own book. These are in this book. He quoted from his own book. Oh, I asked him, I said, where would I find an example that advanced extraterrestrials might come to the earth sharing the secrets of heaven? And he said, well, Tom, it's happened once before. And I said, where? He said, haven't you read Genesis 6? Now think about that. He's using a story to imply our space brothers were once here they're coming back. They're going to correct our version of the gospel. And he is using as a sample of that who we would call fallen angels. And in fact, they did come to the earth once before and they did share the secrets of heaven. They shared the secrets of genetic manipulation. And the Bible tells us in Genesis that eventually all flesh, both man and beast, had been corrupted and it led to the fiat of the flood and God having to purify the world. They shared the secrets of metallurgy. They taught men how to make superior weapons so they could more efficiently kill one another. They taught the secrets, it says, of potions and allures. And some of the ancient texts say they taught women how to make lures so that they could lure both men and angels into their bedrooms. So, yeah, they came down, but these are the last guys on earth, right, <coughs> that I would get all choked up about, <laughs> that I would consider to be my space brothers, and they're coming back again. So when I question him about that, he quotes John 10, 16, he makes the same point in the book, and he says, Tom, have you not read, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, see? 
They listen to God better than we do. And there shall be one fold. They're coming with me. And when we come, there will be one shepherd and we're all going to become one fold. But the, the, he then uses this to again quote from his own book in that he says, perhaps it is not so far-fetched to see the second person of the Trinity, the Word, talking about Jesus, who was present in the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, coming to lay down his life and to take it up again, John 10.18. Look at this. Not only as the Son of Man. Now, he's talking about aliens here. That's all we're talking about, as the Son of Man, but also as a child of these other races. And here's the email I sent back to him. I said, Brother Cosmonalgo, really? Do Vatican scholars actually believe that Jesus might have been the star child of an alien race? Do you and other Jesuits secretly hold that the virgin birth was in reality an abduction scenario in which Mary was impregnated by E.T. giving birth to the hybrid Jesus? And he would not answer that question, but in fact, that is exactly what he says. Well, bottom line, during our investigation, we compiled... What? Oh. It might have been painted by a famous Franciscan, but probably not. We compiled it. If you read the book, you'll see an extraordinary number of additional documents written by Jesuits and Opus Dei level church theologians that are now arguing in favor of, number one, advanced ETIs exist and are more likely superior than men. Number two, therefore, they will be evangelizing us. Number three, we are going to need to change our theology. Here's a quick example. Can I have five extra minutes? Uh, a quick example, Father Giuseppe Tenzalaniti, an Opus Dei theologian of the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome, in other words, the Pope's uh, university, argues how such... Oh, and this entire paper, which is a very large theological dissertation by him, is also on the free DVD, but he makes this argument... Uh, how a contact with spiritual ETs is not going to immediately oblige the Christians to renounce their faith in God simply on the basis of the reception of new, unexpected information of a religious character from extraterrestrial civilizations, but that such a renunciation could come soon after as the new religious content originating from outside the earth is confirmed as reasonable and credible. How in the world would you confirm alien information Information as reasonable and credible. Again, it goes back to I think they think they have a deal with somebody. Uh, but in any case, once the trustworthiness of the information has been verified, the believer would have to reconcile such new information with the truth that he or she already knows and believes on the basis of the revelation of the one and triune God, conducting a re-reading of the gospel inclusive of the new data. Well, I think the Bible has some intriguing things to say about all this too. Very quickly, the Antichrist will appear with all lying signs and wonders, 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Secondly, his, company, his, com his coming will be marked by fearful sights and great signs from heaven, Luke 21, 11. Also, don't forget the Bible tells us that men's heart will fail them for fear for seeing those things that are coming upon the earth. Thirdly, the Antichrist and false prophet will be aligned with the powers of the air and able to call down fire from heaven. Fourthly, and this is one of the more intriguing ones, is Daniel who says that the Antichrist will champion worship of a strange alien God. Daniel eleven thirty-eight 38 through 39, in his estate shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. And the Hebrew language here, Chris Putnam would verify, the Hebrew text there can literally be translated uh, uh, an alien God. Well, as a result of these verses and ongoing investigation into Petrus Romanus and Exa Vaticana, I have come to suspect one thing and to believe three others. Number one, I suspect that a form of great deception is at our doorstep and the world's most politically powerful church seems to be playing into the hands of evil supernaturalism. It is obvious now that the Vatican is preparing for, even perhaps monitoring from Mount Graham, the approaching of an alien savior. I suspect that. But I believe that much of the UFO and especially alien abduction phenomenon is demonic, part of a great setup, the likes of which the world is unprepared for and that could overwhelm the average, average person's senses in the not-too-distant future. You'll notice there it says, read short statement I prepared. 
I'm not going to read it. Number three, but great deception is coming. And ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Somebody say amen. amen. And finally, I believe the entire world is soon going to witness the power of Christ over the deceptive ones as it describes a near future seen in Revelation 9, 11, 21. And I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him in white horses. Nita, make sure they're evangelical. You can read the rest for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for allowing me to come here today and to talk to you once again.